Sikkim 365 and Baylor Plus have teamed up to bring Baylor fans the ultimate content bundle. You can sign up now for $17.99 a month, a $5 monthly savings, and get instant access to all premium content on both websites. For more information, visit either Sikkim365.com or BaylorPlus.com today. What's up, Baylor family? Welcome to Inside Baylor Sports, the official daily podcast of Baylor Athletics. It's Friday, October 18th, and today, Grace and I are going to discuss Baylor's offensive keys to the game against Texas Tech on Saturday and also give our game picks, game predictions for this contest. Game that will kick off at 3 p.m. Central Time and be aired live on ESPN2. Grayson, man, this has been a super interesting series uh, for the last few years, dating back to 2018, um, really from 2018 to 21. All of those games were close. Uh, 4.5 points margin of victory for either team, either way. Very close all across the board. And then 2022, Baylor goes to Lubbock, blows their doors off tw- by 28. Reverse that, come back to Waco last year. Texas Tech wins by 25. Um, neither one of those teams were great teams. Um, you know, Baylor's team in, in 22, bowl game. That's it, six and seven on the final record. Last year, Tech wins seven games, uh, goes to a bowl game and beats Cal. Uh, just a strange kind of series in general, but really a rivalry that's developed dating back to 2010. For Saturday, this game is currently a six and a half point line, right around there, depending on where you get it. Um, the last eight minute meetings are four and four, split straight down the middle. Baylor's actually won four of the last six, um, but it, in general, it's just a kind of a weird back and forth series. And obviously for both of these teams, the pedigree started with offense, and that's what we're discussing now. It's the offensive side of the ball and how these teams want to approach these games. And for me, I don't really know what to expect in this game. I think in the first three Big 12 games that Baylor's played, we knew what to expect from these games um, to an extent. But in this game, I don't know which way it's going to go. I think you could see a variety of different outcomes, and I wouldn't be surprised – from either one. And maybe that's because we don't really know what to fully expect from either one of these teams. I agree with that. You know, I I think in general, the, the only scenario that I find to be rather unlikely is Baylor blowing out tech. I don't really see that being a, a, at least that's definitely not a trend that we've seen so far this year. So that would be pretty shocking if Baylor was able to accomplish that. But either of the other ones, whether it's Baylor winning close, Tech winning close, or Tech blowing out Baylor, uh, those wouldn't really surprise me at all. And, you know, a lot of it is going to come down to this Texas Tech offense versus the Baylor defense. Um, Tech's offense is very, very good. The advanced analytics really speak to that. I mean, most metrics you look at that talk offense have tech is like a top 30 offense in the country and that does also take into account the fact that taj brooks didn't play in the washington state game so maybe they put up a few more numbers in that game and it looks a little bit better as well um but in general this is one of the more balanced teams that baylor will have played all year long this is uh, again according to most metrics probably the best offense baylor's played up to this point as well um, and, and that's definitely pretty scary, especially seeing the fact that Baylor's given up some points to some okay offenses that aren't rate, rated as highly as Tech's. Yeah, uh, obviously they're a very balanced team. And, and it's interesting um, when you look at Baylor's side of the ball, which we'll be discussing today, offensive keys, they're, they're from the same mold, right? The Zach Kitley offense, the Jake Spavital offense, they're going to do very similar things. They're going to use a lot, of, a lot of short passing game, Um Baylor wants to run the football and the effectiveness with the effectiveness that Tech does. They don't have a Taj Brooks. I think that Taj Brooks could make this Baylor offensive line look a lot better in the run game department. I think that he would do that for a lot of teams in the the way they can utilize that. And that offense is obviously established. Um, So for Baylor specifically, knowing that the run game's struggling, um, knowing uh, that they've actually, in terms of points scored, have exceeded expectations – I would say in all of their games in Big 12 play, once Sawyer Robertson took over, and it is an interesting dynamic because they're still scoring points. It's just like, okay, how are they getting it done? What well, majority of it comes from the passing game, um, Sawyer Robertson making plays, and we're going to talk more and more about that in, in in our keys of the game. But for you, what are you looking at? Uh, maybe as your top, I don't, I don't necessarily want to label these as one through three, but 
what is your top key to this game for Baylor's offense to score points and being in the end? So I think we mentioned this a little bit in our preview, but it's the red zone. And the red zone is yeah. going to be so pivotal in this game. I mean, you look at Tech, and they've given up 28 opponent red zone attempts. That's outside the top 100 in the nation. Um, they allow you to drive up and down the field. And they've allowed pretty much every team they've played to do that. Um, yeah. The question comes down to do those teams settle for field goals? Do they not score any points or do they score touchdowns? And that's kind of been um, something that I've definitely thought about a lot. And the reason that I've thought about it so much is because Baylor has not been very good at taking advantage of those situations. They're 108th in the nation in scoring uh, on those red zone opportunities. They're just 13 out of 17. Uh, a lot of that comes down to missed field goals. Some of that comes down to fourth down going forward and not getting it. Um, and so I do think that that's going to be a, uh, uh, probably a an area that when we look back at who won this game, the team that wins it probably will have done much better in the red zone than the other team. Yeah, so you mentioned that kind of uh, willingly kind of take what the defense gives you, Tech's defense is that bend but don't break, whatever you want to call it. Tech is, is giving up 23.5 first downs against Power 5 opponents per game. That's 15th in the Big 12. That's not good. But then, as you mentioned, they get into the red zone, and there's a ton of red zone trips. I think it was like 28 red zone trips mm -hmm. this year. Um, and it, I think Arizona went like complete reverse trend. Like they were kicking field goals that entire game, for instance. I don't think Baylor can survive. Like, I don't think you can go in there and say, fourth down, let's kick it six times. Mm -hmm. Let's kick six field goals. That doesn't make sense to me in this particular game. I think Baylor has to score points. So if you're if you're just playing the law of averages, you go for it on fourth down, you say, hey, we're gonna. We might not get a touchdown this time, but we're banking that we're going to get one next time if we don't get it here. I I'm with you. Like you got to plan on scoring points once you get to the red zone. Field goals. I can't imagine field goals winning. Arizona doing that in in uh, that game at Arizona with Tech on the road made more sense. You can't do that in Lubbock. Um, and Baylor's got to go. And, and I mentioned this before, and I was really surprised by this set in terms of scoring touchdowns against Power Five opponents in the red zone. Right now, Baylor is ranked six in the Big 12, which is – I thought Baylor would have been 10th or below. And they score touchdowns 62.5% of the time. They've done it pretty well since Sawyer Robertson has taken over at quarterback. A lot of that – I would say all of that comes through the air. Um, he does have a couple of rushing touchdowns as well. But they're going to have to get into the red zone and then find success. Tech has not, percentage-wise, given up a ton of touchdowns in the red zone. Um, and, that, and that's just – I mean – it has to be a reason that they win this game is because they go to the red zone and figure out how to score. And they're going to either get a turnover or make you miss a field goal. And that's what Baylor can't do. Right. Yeah. Baylor's got to take advantage of those kind of opportunities. And like you said, th this Baylor's not going to win this game with a bunch of field goals. They're just not, you know, we're, we'll talk about it more when we talk about the defense, but I think both you and I have quite a few concerns about how many points tech is potentially going to score in this game um so for baylor you got to take advantage when you get these opportunities got to score touchdowns and when you do kick the field goals you got to make them yeah yeah no for sure and, and one of the things that i've tracked and uh it's just kind of like what obviously it's not anything abnormal that you track but what is baylor doing in terms of scoring points versus what their opponents typically give up and, and they have scored more points than what their opponents typically give up and so you look at a tech defense that's given up 30.5 points a game against power five opponents well you, there's going to be opportunities to score those points and i don't think tech's going to allow you to get a ton of explosive plays um that's just how their style is going to be and then they're going to figure out how to take it away and get turnovers so better's going to have to avoid the turnovers and if they can avoid turnovers and not settle for field goals, I think they'll put up a decent chunk of points in this game. Um, and that's just based on what we know about each team. That doesn't equate anything crazy happening. Um, it's just kind of the the status quo for both of these teams at this point of saying Tech's going to allow them, Baylor can score them. And that leads me to my first point, and it's easy to say. It's like Sawyer Robertson, don't turn the ball over, throw the football, and if you happen to get a running game with it, great. Um, I think that was an emphasis for Baylor in, this, um, in their off week. And Dave Aranda mentioned just working on the fundamentals of running the football, figuring out what you do best and doing it more often. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Baylor shakes some things up on the offensive line if they feel like somebody's going to give them a better opportunity to run the football. Um, and then within the passing game, if you're not sacrificing too much in pass protection, they're going to get the ball out of Sawyer Robertson's hands quick, and he's shown good pro pocket presence. So Sawyer Robertson, don't turn the football over. 
avoid sacks at all costs. Um, obviously, you don't want that to result in a major loss loss of yardage on a play where you're trying to scramble and it's not there. But Tech doesn't rush. You know, they don't rush the passer to a high effectiveness. They're they're I think they're 16th uh, in sacks per game against Power Five opponents in the league. Um, 13th, sorry, not 15th, not nearly as bad. So a little bit more credit there. Um, if they can avoid those negative plays and, and not turn the ball over, particularly by Sawyer in the passing game, that's going to give them the best chance to win uh, on the offensive side of the ball. I agree with that. And and I do think, you know, him taking care of the ball is going to be a focal point. I, I mean, just the passing game in general is an area that I, I think, you know, we're going to have to dive pretty deep on here in a second, because I, I just think that's the, that's the advantage that Baylor has yeah. in this mm-hmm. game. And it's going to have to be in, you know, you, you mentioned kind of this, the sack numbers tech is 118th in the nation in sacks so far this season. They have yeah. just six, 118th. That is, that bodes so well for Baylor, or at least it should, you know, we'll see yeah. if Baylor can take advantage of that, but it should. They're also outside the top 100 in tackles for loss as yeah. well. They do not create havoc whatsoever. And yeah, this, this might be one of those situations where it's a turning point for tech, but if it is, that's truly disappointing from the Baylor offensive line. If this game becomes the game that tech gets four sacks and eight tackles for loss, that's pretty unacceptable um, based on how these two teams have played so far this year. I'm curious if Baylor does make any changes on the offensive line heading into this week. You kind of mentioned it and they've kind of had this dilemma all season where it's you got Alvin Ebasele being the better run blocker. And yeah. then you got Caden Siraki being the better pass blocker. And then you got Sidney Fugar who started coming in games as well when uh, Campbell Barrington was out. So very curious kind of how they decide to go about that going forward into the second half of the season. Cause I, I do think changes need to happen if they actually want to be able to run the football. Um, and you're right. You can only run the football if you're taking care of the football and not getting behind early and often in this game. Got to be able to keep the game script positive. Yeah, and that that was the the point, uh, the position that I was making a point on at potential changes would be at the left tackle position. I think everything else is not set in stone by any means, but that's been the the weak point for Baylor's offensive line. And weak point knowing, like, hey, if if Caden's in the game, they're probably going to pass it. If Alvin's in the game, they're probably going to run it. And then I think the balance, truthfully, might be Sidney Fugar in the in the idea that like if Alvin's in the game, what are you gonna get from a run run production standpoint? It's gonna be positive. If he can match that at all, I think there's some balance of him in pass protection. I think there's some opportunities for him to be okay there. So it's kind of like, what is he good at, and can he help this offense in that particular area if they're gonna make a change? And so if they're if they're putting an emphasis on running the football, then it's the lesser of two evils in terms of pass protection. Um, if they want to run the football with him on the left side and he's the best option, well, you might sacrifice some in pass protection, but maybe he's still a step up over what Alvin was, for instance. So I'm really curious to see what that plays out. And I mean, David Randa mentioned in his press conference, like running the football, they have to figure it out. They've gotten away from it. I mean, even that Colorado game, they had 41 attempts, I believe it was. And then against BYU and Iowa State, they just said, screw it. We're not even going to really try it. I mean, outside of the quarterback run, we're going to do it a little bit. They got the, got the running backs more involved in the passing game. Um, Bryson Washington had several catches in, in both of those two games against BYU and Iowa State. And uh, and that could be a way to get them the ball. But I think they want to go in the Texas Tech game against a defense that does pretty well against the run, but are not. To me, even with Iowa State struggles and their numbers, they face some pretty good rush offenses. They're not Iowa State. They're not BYU. Um, and I'm really curious to see how Baylor comes out in this game and attacks this game against Texas X front, which has shown pretty good success in spots against the run. I think in general tech is pretty good against the run. I I think it's similar to Colorado. And if you go look at the Colorado game, you might say, Oh, the overall numbers are, are good, but it's kind of skewed because you had the Sora Robertson 50 yard touchdown run outside of that. It really was not a great day running the football. Now it was better than what we've seen against Iowa state and against BYU. Uh, But I think tech is going to pose similar challenges to what Colorado did, honestly, with Baylor trying to run the football with their running backs. 
Um, I think Sora Robertson will have opportunities to run the football because in the games that Tech has had to play a mobile quarterback, uh, they've struggled. I mean, you go look at Washington State, which is a different level of athlete at quarterback uh, with Mateer. I mean, he he ran for 200 yards. Sora's not going to run for 200 yards. But um, if you look at like Brendan Soresby at Cincinnati, he had 52 yards rushing. I think he's got like 13 yards rushing in the other four or five games that they've played. So, I mean, he went five times over that in that game against Texas Tech. And so I think that's an area where I think Sawyer can also have an impact on this game. And that kind of leads me into just in general, um, this feels very much on the offensive side, like a game that's going to come down to how good is Sawyer Robertson. Um, I I truly think that this game is going to be determined by that. And if he comes out and takes advantage of a, pretty bad tech defense one of the worst defenses Baylor's played all year then Baylor's got a chance to put up 30 something points which on the road you know they it should be enough to at minimum put you in the game and at minimum give you a chance to win the game Um, and so you look at kind of what tech's given up this year gave up 506 passing yards to Abilene Christian 282 passing yards to Arizona State 426 to Cincinnati and 301 yards to Arizona um and then Tech can't get after the quarterback well. They don't get sacks. They don't create tackles for loss. So Baylor should be able to find themselves in third and four, third and three type situations instead of third and eight more times than not if they take advantage of things. So Sora should have a relatively clean pocket. You're facing a secondary that's been pretty bad all season long. I know they've gotten a few guys back, but I still don't think they're very good there. Um, and so all of this sets up pretty well for Sawyer to be able to take advantage of these opportunities. And I think he's going to have to, because I do anticipate that Tech's probably going to score in the thirties as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, you look at at what Tech did uh, across the board against Arizona State, Cincy and Arizona, that didn't include the Washington State. There's just conference games only. They are across the board. They haven't really had a bright spot where they said, okay, Cincinnati does this really well. We're going to take this away doing this. And like, so like I look at the FEI ratings of their defense, which is the ab, like it stands out from the crowd. It's like 24 for their defense. Well, it just, it truly comes down to turnovers and their third down conversions to me. They're really good at not giving up third down conversions. Now, how often are they in them? I think that's kind of the question mark is like, how often are they in third down conversions to make those third down conversions really mean much? Are teams getting to third down or are they getting first downs on second downs? I haven't broken it all down. Uh, but I think that was leading me to my key is you mentioned it getting to third or four and less and not because you have to get it on third and four or less, but it sets you up. If you don't take a sack or get a tackle for loss, which tech does not do well, is getting to that and then saying, okay, it's fourth and one. We feel pretty good in this situation because we got three yards on third and four that we can go for it. I think tech's defense is just so interesting. Like we saw what they did against Abilene Christian. They're susceptible to doing that. We saw what they did against Cincinnati. Um, and then truthfully across the board, what they have given up on defense every single week is more than what their opponents typically do. Um, so I think Baylor is going to have that, but if they can't convert be in the third and short situation, so kind of like a, uh, indirect key to the game, it is a, it is a key to the game, but it's like, what's that line of, if they can be in third and four or less, I mean, they're going to be in great position to move the ball, uh, get into the red zone they just can't turn it over like that. I mean, that's that's the end of the game. It's don't turn the ball over because when Tech has stopped people, you watch that Arizona game. They had Arizona had chances to score points, especially at the end of the first half, and a terrible throw uh, by the, the Arizona quarterback that should have been the ball that was thrown out of bounds ends up being an interception in the end zone. Tech goes down and kicks their own field goal to end the half. Baylor cannot afford to do that, especially on the road. Um, but yeah, just. Third down and third downs in general, stay on the field, execute in the red zone. And it's it's going to you mentioned it. Sawyer Roberts gonna have to make plays all kind of intertwined of what these keys of the offense are. And I think you can say it for anyone, right? I think mean, any team you say turnovers, third down conversions, but for this Baylor team that does not run the football well, you can't afford to be in third and seven. And they know there's no chance of you running the football. Right. And that's how you solve a uh, a team that can't pass rush well give them a bunch of opportunities where you're standing back there in third and eight because while they haven't shown to be great pass rushers if you're giving them multiple chances where Sawyer's going to have to take a drop back and he's going to have to hold the ball for a little bit that's where problems arise especially when those defensive ends can pin their ears back so I agree with that I think that's important I also think 
you know, for those third and three, third and four type situations, it also sets up a lot shorter distances for fourth downs as well. You know, if you're going to go through that throughout the the game, you know, if you can get into multiple fourth and ones, you know, you're feeling like you're probably going to go for it. I mean, Jake Spavitol has been rather aggressive in that area, and that's kind of continued from what Jeff Grimes did uh, during his time at Baylor as well. It seems kind of like a philosophical approach by Baylor, probably something Dave Aranda has a hand in too. They go for it quite a bit. Um, yeah. Felt like they probably could have gone for it more against Iowa State. But I think the uh, the other area that I wanted to look at as far as a key, and I, I feel like it uh, this always matters more for the offense, is this road slate that Baylor's had to play this year. I think for an offense, the the environment matters a whole lot more than it does for the defense. I think defenses, yeah. you, it travels a lot better um, than an offense sometimes does. And, you know, we kind of saw that during the browse era, you know, they went on the road a few times and, and laid a couple eggs because, you know, sometimes the environments are, are tough and they, and they put a lot of yeah. pressure on a quarterback and a lot of pressure on an offense, but Baylor's been tested on the road so far this year. I mean, having to go to Utah, uh, in a really tough environment. I know it wasn't a big 12 game, but their first big 12 game technically against a big 12 team. Uh, they had to go on the road for a night game against Colorado with uh, them playing well with Deion Sanders, with this crowd going crazy with it raining. Um, that's not ideal. And then you go on the road to Ames, one of the toughest places to play in the big 12 and another night game uh, there. And so that crowd was ready to go and amped up. Yeah. And I think in general, just like, them having to go and face all these challenges on the road during this first part of the year should set themselves up very well to go into Lubbock and really not be as phased as you can be when you travel on the road. I think that's going to be huge for this team. I think it will add some, uh, a little bit of a calming factor to everyone on the offense because they've done it already three times before against three really good teams and, and three teams that are going to be bowl teams, if not more, you know, when you yeah. look at Iowa state. And so, um, yeah, I think that's another piece of this puzzle. Uh, that is a reason why I, I do think Baylor can kind of be even more prepared and ready for this matchup. Yeah. And then you talk about the, the Utah game, obviously cam rising now officially out for the season. Baylor literally, he played four, three halves this season. They got a half of that and yeah. was the difference, literally the difference in the game with, was him being healthy. After he went out, Baylor completely shut down Utah and kind of the same Utah that we see right now that is playing. That second half Utah against Baylor was completely different. Um, then we saw Colorado. I mean, honestly, they should have beaten Kansas State over the weekend. They they had the opportunity after the interception. So like a fringe potential top 25 team. Then you throw in Iowa State in really tough environments and and, I, you know, I don't want to just dwell a lot on the on the schedule because last year Baylor had eight home games. But, man, what a tough stretch for Baylor to start the season. And now you throw in Tech, who is, I don't want to say exceeding expectations, but I think in a lot of ways they are exceeding what anyone expected to do at the beginning of the season to go 5-1. and one. Um, You know, Taj Brooks, they could be 6-0. and oh. And so you're throwing another layer onto that tough start to the schedule. Um, and you look at their combined records of all those games. I mean, heck, even Tarleton, you know, Tarleton's an FCS team, but they've that's the only loss they have this year is to Baylor. Air Force has struggled um, on Baylor's other uh, out-of-conference game, but overall, that Baylor State played a really tough schedule, and especially you look at the, t the high end with BYU, Iowa State specifically now, that's kind of trending that direction. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really anxious to see how this team responds, and truly, I mean, you look at the Colorado game, Sawyer started that game, um, but they kind of held him back. And you look at the stats in the game, I think he had 21 pass attempts. He completed or 22 pass, whatever it was. And then since then, they've kind of unleashed him. So we don't – it was the Iowa State game was his first true environment of really going out and, to me, playing full quarterback experience. And now you get a, his second chance to really do it. I'm curious to see how he responds, how the offense in general responds. Their back's been up against the wall the entire season, but it really is on Saturday. It definitely is. This is a game where, again, I, I mean, I think, you know, the over under is 55 and a half. So Vegas isn't actually anticipating this being a shootout, a uh, full on shootout, uh, kind of just mid 20s type game. Yeah. Um, I'm a little surprised by that. I would probably lean towards the over uh, for yeah. me. And and I know I've heard other people like I think Craig on the Bearcast yesterday said 31 24 in favor of tech, which is like, 
right on the number. I don't even think he knew what the over under was and he put 55 points on there. So that yeah. was uh, quite the call there. I think this game will be more high scoring, which again, that puts more pressure on Baylor. Uh, I do want to mention, I know we've talked a lot about Baylor's opening schedule and I do think it's tougher than Tech's, but Tech has played a, a pretty good schedule yeah. kind of out of nowhere. Just, you know, you don't really think of Cincinnati being great, but they're four and two Arizona state, Again, another shocker is five and one. Uh, they've beaten both of them. Arizona is 500. They're not great. But then Washington State is obviously having a pretty good year as well. Um, so Tex won some games. I mean, yeah. they, they've beaten a, a few good teams. And the overall record of the teams they've played is pretty good, too. Uh, kind of like Baylor's. Now, I don't think they've had to play one of the top, you know, three or four teams in the conference like Baylor has. Uh, but I do think they've, they've played some quality teams and fared well. Um, I also want to mention, you know, I don't know that I have much stats behind this, but Tex played all but one game at home so far this year. Um, so I, I'm not going to say that they're just going to be comfortable at home, but I do think, you know, when you're going on the road and then you come back home and there's kind of these breaks in your schedule more so, uh, I do think that helps for the crowd to be even crazier and a, a little bit more excited i think when you get into the consistency of just oh another home game another home game another home game yeah. um you know may, maybe there's something to that i'm not going to say that the tech crowd won't be crazy because i think they will be since tech is five and one and they're playing against baylor um but i do think there's a little something to be said for just kind of the monotony of just playing at home over and over again we kind of saw that with baylor last year where those home games just started not really becoming events uh because partly because Baylor wasn't very good and also because Baylor had eight home games last year. Yeah, no, it does. And, and it's, I mean, if anybody that's traveling to these games frequently, it just, as a fan, you get that. Oh yeah. We got to go next weekend. We got to go next weekend. And Baylor has not had that this year. Like the home games. I mean, they had the BYU game, um, which was the way that it started completely took the crowd out of it. But in general, they haven't had that opportunity to be amped up for a game. Now, if they win against Tech this weekend, they come home against Oklahoma State, that crowd should be a little bit more lively. But it's still, there's a lot of things that go into having a good home environment. Yeah. For for this game particularly, I think Tech fans will be excited. Um, but I think it's more because they're 5-1 and one and not necessarily because they're facing 2-4 and four Baylor. So I'm curious how the atmosphere turns. It's not a night game, which is favorable for Baylor. I mean, you, you did it in Ames. You did it in Boulder. Fortunately, this one isn't. Um, it's kind of right in the middle. So it will finish as a, as a night game. It'll, the end of that game will be uh, – the sun will be setting. So I'm really curious to see how Tech fans react, the energy that they have. I think Joey McGuire is going to have Tech fired up for this game. I mean, I, I don't know what he said in this press conference this week. Uh, I didn't – haven't listened until uh, this point. I probably will before the game. But I, he's going to have that team ready to play. There's a lot of Baylor overlap, a lot of connections that he brought over. And not always all in the, on the best terms. Um, there's a lot of things that went on. A lot of personnel people that are over there. A lot of former players that are on that staff. I mean, I believe Taylor Young is on his staff right now um, as a, a quality control. Um, then obviously Brian Nance, a former uh, Baylor football player. There's a lot of a lot of names over there. Is is Lockhart still there? He was. I there believe for he a is bit too. Yeah, I believe yeah, he's James there. Lockhart. Yeah. yeah, so another former Baylor guy. I mean, there, this is honestly, this is the part of the the slate where, you know, I've been covering recruiting for a long time, and obviously I know you've followed it as well, Colt. Um, but these next three games are kind of those fun games where I look at the roster and I'm just like, oh, I know that kid, I know that kid. Like just all these battles that Baylor and Tech have had uh, for recruits, and that's the same with Oklahoma State and TCU, which are the next three games here. Um, that makes it kind of fun too. And even in the transfer portal, like, there's guys that Baylor battled Tech for this offseason and, and yeah. didn't get, or guys that Tech tried to get that Baylor got. Um, you got a guy like Caleb Douglas, who I'm sure a lot of Baylor fans don't remember. He was a Baylor commit at one yeah. time, and then he went to Florida, and then he transferred to Texas Tech. Yeah. Um, it's just a lot of those little things that all kind of come together, and you go and look at it and you're like, yeah, Baylor didn't recruit Taj Brooks, or Baylor you know, didn't recruit this guy, or Baylor did recruit this guy and lost a battle. I, I always find that really interesting when you start playing these type of direct recruiting competitors. Yeah, it is. There's there's a lot of overlap in these games, and you mentioned it on an episode earlier this week. Like These are important games for recruiting. Uh, it's important fa uh, games for the fan bases. Like if, if Baylor beats Tech this weekend, that's more valuable than Baylor beating Iowa – well, Iowa State not the best example, but beating Colorado a few weeks ago – but then losing to Texas Tech on the road. But Baylor fans would take that trade in a heartbeat to say, let's beat Tech in Lubbock and give up that win 
uh, over oh. Colorado. You want them yeah. both, but you're going to trade them out. So, uh, yeah, it's it's it's, uh, it's important for a lot of reasons, and especially when you talk about a series that has been pretty much even for the last 15 seasons or so since dating back to 2010. Um, it, it's it's become a fun a fun game. There's some hate in it. Um, but it's also fun and it makes that's what makes college football great. So, okay, with all that, we got to get to our game picks. Um, I, I know that you and I go into these episodes knowing kind of who we're going to pick, but not always the score. That's at least me. Um, so I'm just like, okay, let's talk through it a little bit more and figure out what my score prediction is going to be. So I'm going to let you tell me what your score prediction <laughs> is first on this one. And then, as I always do, and then I'll give you mine. But what, what are your final thoughts on the outcome of this game? So I told Craig on the Bearcats earlier this week, um, I picked a really close game and I picked a high scoring game. I think Baylor's going to score points here. I, I think Baylor is going to be able to travel on the road and put together a very competitive game. Um, and I think what they do well and what, what they do well and their weaknesses actually match up pretty well against Texas Tech's defense. And so that kind of leads me to thinking that Jake Spavaton and Sora Robertson are probably going to put together a pretty good game plan and have some success on offense. Uh, defensively, I am uh, very nervous that Baylor's defense um, is going to get gashed at times in this game. Um, I just have not seen enough from Baylor defensively to say, oh yeah, this is a really good defense or that, this is even a you know top six in the league type defense. And so I have questions coming in. I do think Dave Randa getting an extra week to prepare uh, will put Baylor in to uh, give them some chances to make plays, create havoc, whether it's sacks or turnovers. Um, I think he will put them in position enough to where they're not hemorrhaging points. But make no mistake, Tech is going to get theirs, I think, at some point in this game. Uh, but in general, I, I think, you know, as much as I don't trust Baylor, really at all to close out games. Uh, I think that's become a reoccurring theme and we know this is probably going to be a close game. I just can't help but to think this is the perfect moment for Baylor to put it all together and have a performance that really turns their season around potentially. Um, I think this is a game that means a lot. I've called this a must win because I don't think they're making a bowl game without winning this game. Um, and so for that reason, uh, I think Baylor's going to go on the road and they're going to beat Texas Tech 34 31. All right, man. Like I did honestly, when you were laying that out, I didn't think you were going in that direction. I didn't like, yeah. I think there's, there's so many factors in this game that Baylor has to do the things that they have not done well necessarily. And they have to do them well to win. Um, I don't necessarily think it's going to be that high scoring. I think that there is potential for it, but I also think there's potential for say, for instance, sex is set getting up and leaning into Taj Brooks and saying, okay, let's see if you can stop it. Baylor's struggling to do that, and the game gets short. The points get limited, uh, but it's not because necessarily anybody's stopping anybody. I think that's potential outcome for this game. Um, for me, after Baylor did not run Sawyer Robertson against Iowa State very much at all, he, sit, he had a couple scrambles, but they did not use him in the true design quarterback run game. I think Baylor goes back to that a little bit more in this particular game. I don't think they wanted to do it against BYU. I don't think they wanted to do it against Iowa State, who played very physical defense and have that ability. Not that Tech can't be physical, but I think it's just a different element of what this Tech defense is versus what those two, particularly in the front seven, can be. Um, and because of that, I think this game gets shorter and it gets to more be more low scoring. Um, I'm going with 31 to 28 Tech. Um, and just that's basically because I don't think that Baylor can finish out this game. I think they're going to score points. Maybe there's a missed field goal that keeps it from being tied up. Um, but 31 28, and just knowing that if Baylor wants to win this game, they have to avoid turnovers and they have to be able to find some type of running game. Um, I think they will find it with some with Sawyer, but the issue is they're not finding it with running backs still. Um, even though they dedicated time towards it in the off week, I just don't know if there is a path to winning this game without having running backs have pretty strong success. I don't, dude, I'm not expecting like five yards per carry for 200 yards. I don't think that's realistic. I don't think really, truly who else is going to, I don't think in, there's many teams that will do that against tech when they're set to stopping the run. Um, but if, I, if Texas tech goes out there and says, Hey, we know you're going to throw it really well. And we know that's kind of our area that we struggle. So we're going to go super light box. We're going to, we're going to let you run the football. We're going to see if you can run the football against our front five. And, and maybe hit some passes to tight ends and take everything out of, else, uh, take it away. If Baylor can't run the football in that situation, then they have issues because I don't think Tech is a great rush defensive team. I think they're a solid rush defense team, but if they remove everybody, everybody from the box, 
Baylor better be able to run the football because I don't think they're going to have another opportunity if they can't prove it this week against Texas Tech. Right. I mean, yeah, that's going to be a part of this is just kind of how do these teams um, strategize against each other and game plan, you know, kind of for what they're going to see uh, against the other. And they have plenty of tape now and a bye week. So you feel like these two teams are probably going to be pretty prepared for what they're about to see from the other. Uh, but new wrinkles could be added, of course, uh, during the bye week. It's going to be a fun game. I mean, the fact of the matter is you have them, you have Tech winning another close game, which would put them at 5-0. and oh. Yeah. on the season in one score games which would be all at home uh yeah which would be pretty crazy now you're starting to lean towards you know that tcu team from a few years ago where they won what like 10 games by one score games or something yeah. along those including lines including baylor on a last second field goal in right. game 10 of the season yeah, yeah. i mean it, it's that's it's a tough thing to pick but i think man like and i guess in a way you maybe i should say oh the law of averages man like baylor's not played well in one possession games. They've had heart, I mean, truly heartbreakers since that 2022 season, dating back to that TCU game of like, dude, like when is it going to change? And they haven't, I mean, they've won, they beat Cincinnati. They did have a miracle comeback against UCF, but like those weren't situations like this. And, and it's like, when did these games against BYU come to a win? When did the games against Colorado come to a win? Um, I think that you could say eventually that that happens. I just, I mean, I'm kind of shell shocked. Like, I can't say that it's going to happen this weekend in Lubbock just because it hasn't happened. And tech is showing that they can win close games. Right. And I, I definitely understand that. It, it takes a lot for me to, to pick Baylor here. I just think that, you know, if they don't win this game, I'm probably not going to pick them to win very much going forward. I just, yeah. I, I, I just, I have a hard time seeing a team getting up two weeks, focusing, preparing on this one game, knowing you have to win this game and then losing and then everything's just fine. I just, I, I, I don't know. And I know that they can make a bowl. They could go four and one the rest of the way. I just find that to be highly unlikely uh, if they go into Lubbock and, and just can't find a way to win it. Yep. We will see. We will definitely see. This series has been crazy. Like, I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of ups and downs for both teams in this. Um, so I don't know. I said early in, the, in this episode, I don't know if I really know. I don't know. There's a way to really know how this game is going to play out. I think there's reasons to think one way or the other. Uh, but there's so many different factors that come could come into play to determine, uh, kind of give this determination of the final outcome. So, all right, Baylor family, that's going to do it for this episode of Inside Baylor Sports. As always, thanks to each of you for listening and also for any tech fan who has uh, tuned in this week to enjoy uh, what Grace and I have to say. Uh, but for Grace and Grunhafer, I'm Colt Barber. Have a great game weekend and sick and bears.